My name is Sander van Amersfoort. And when you ask the average European to think about Australia, they usually get quite excited and they'll talk about all the great things such as the great weather, fantastic beaches, the outback, Uluru, and of course, we all have kangaroos in our backyards. And, and when you prod them a bit more, you'll find that Australians are really seen as a friendly lot with a great sporting culture and some fantastically livable cities. However, there's also one thing that is much less known to the average European. My name is Sandler van Amelsvoort, and you're probably wondering, why is this Dutch guy talking to us about the rivalry between two Australian cities? I moved out here about nine years ago, and I work for the Committee for Melbourne, which is an apolitical member network that brings together the business, academic, and community sectors. And together for the last 12 months, I've been fortunate enough to lead the Melbourne 4.0 task force, uh, in which we looked at the future of Melbourne against the backdrop of a rapidly changing environment. And it is in that context that I'd like to talk to you about this Melbourne and Sydney rivalry. A rivalry that's been around for ages and often the topic of great banter. Which is the best place to live? Which sport is more important? Who serves the best coffee? I think we all know that one. Um, but also the rivalry can sometimes turn into disputes, even to the point of building an entire new city. As was the case with Canberra in 1908, after a long dispute between Melbourne and Sydney over the location of Australia's seat of government. And so, while rivalries can be great fun, there are also times when it really doesn't work in our favor. And to illustrate my point, I'd like to show you the following graph. You're probably thinking this must be something between Melbourne and Sydney. But in fact, this is something about the East and the West. Because the great, the, the great British economist Angus Madison did some phenomenal work plotting out the economic history all the year, all the way back to the year one. And as you can see, for, for the first 18 of the past 20 centuries, China and India made up more than half the world economy. And so when people today talk about the phenomenal rise of China and, um, and the, uh, the, the Asian century, most people tend to think about the phenomenal growth that we've seen over the last couple of decades. However, what we're really witnessing is the re-emergence of the historical balance between the East and the West. And when that happens, Australia is going to be in the right in the middle of the most lucrative, but also most intensely competitive regional economic playing field of the 21st century and beyond. And so today I'd like to talk about what happened about 200 years ago and why it's important for what's happening today. But to do that, we have to take a step back even further, about 16,000 years. This is the Social Development Index that was developed by Ian Morris from Stanford University. And with social development, Morris refers to a group's ability to master its physical and intellectual environment to get things done. And it's a fascinating chart because, as you can see, for thousands and thousands of years, humankind was on a very slow upward trajectory. Wars, empires, religions, philosophies, none of them made much of a difference. However, about 200 years ago, something really profound and sudden happened. Or as Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee called it, something happened that literally bent the curve of human history almost 90 degrees. The Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution really marks the decisive turning point for humankind when we see sustained growth in population and incomes for an unprecedented period. And since the first Industrial Revolution, we've had a number of additional uh, major developments in our, in our societies. In fact, the World Economic Forum and others have identified another three industrial revolution. The first one, about two, uh, late 1700s, uh, saw the rise of the first cities, uh, urbanization and increased life expectancies in those cities. Then about 100 years later, the second industrial revolution saw enormous improvements in public health and sanitation, saw the rise of the middle class and the introduction of public education. And then another 100 years later, the third industrial revolution saw the introduction of the mainframe computer, the personal computer, and the internet. And I don't think I need to explain to any of you here what an enormous impact that has made on all of our lives. And now most people believe that we're still in that third industrial revolution, but we believe we are actually at the st early stages of the fourth industrial revolution. 
where we're seeing a convergence of the physical, digital, and biological systems. And the fourth industrial revolution will be unlike anything humankind has seen before, and it will profoundly change the way we live, work, and do business. As you can just imagine, in a few years from now, what billions and billions of people will be able to do when they're all connected by mobile devices with almost unlimited storage capacity, processing power, and access to knowledge. And you multiply all of that with today's emerging breakthroughs in nanotechnology, material science, autonomous vehicles, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, the list goes on and on and on. So you can imagine that in such a world, the ability for cities and companies to innovate will be absolutely crucial to their ability to compete and prosper. So where does this Melbourne-Sydney rivalry fit into all of this? Well, let me show you the following map. This is a stunning image that the North American Space Agency took between April and October of 2012. Of 400 Im and it put it together of 400 images that it took over that period of the, of the uh, nighttime light emissions of humanity's greatest centers, cities. And today, more than half the world's population lives in cities. And for decades, researchers have been looking into this phenomenon. And then about 10 years ago, three urban researchers, Richard Florida, Tim Golden, and Charlotte Melander, produced a groundbreaking study into what they coined the rise of the mega region. Now, mega regions are integrated sets of cities with their surrounding suburban hinterlands, across which you can easily move labor and capital. And up until their study, we used to look at the world economy almost exclusively through the lens of nation states. However, with today's globalization, capital and labor can move a lot more freely. And so national boundaries start to mean a lot less. And this brings me to the really interesting point, because in their study, they found that the world's top 40 mega regions house only 18% of the world's population, but they're responsible for two thirds of global economic output and close to 90% of patent and innovation. In other words, mega regions are the central competitive unit. So what do they look like? On the North American continent, we've got the vast Boston, New York and Washington corridor. Or over in the West, the Cascadian Corridor stretches all the way from Portland and Seattle right across the Canadian border into Vancouver. And in Southern California, we see the sprawl of Los Angeles passing right down to San Diego across the Mexican border into Tijuana. And Tijuana and San Diego now even share an airport terminal into which you can exit into either country. And moving over to Europe, where you can see many mega regions, including Europe's largest one, the one that I grew up in, stretching all the way from Amsterdam in the north, right down to the Ruhr in Germany, past Brussels and Antwerp in Belgium, and into Lille in the north of France. And I'm moving over to Asia, where the Asian century is being driven by the powerhouse mega regions, such as the Yangtze River Delta, which houses only 6% of China's population, but is responsible for a full 20% of that country's economy. And similarly, the Pearl River Delta, with its 11 cities around Hong Kong and Guangzhou, soaks up a massive 20% of foreign direct investment of China. And that's because it's no longer simply known for its copycat products. It's becoming a world-leading cluster of innovation, with even Apple setting up an R&D center, and The Economist now coining it Silicon Delta. So, when multinationals are looking to invest these days, increasingly, they are looking at mega regions as opposed to individual countries. And so where does this leave Australia? Aside from the major bushfires that you can see in WA because NASA composed a picture of, over a number of months, we have to zoom all the way into the East Coast to find our three capital cities, Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne, none of which are forming an integrated mega region with each other. And that means that all too often our cities are competing with each other for investment and in many instances simply lack the scale to play at the global stage. And so here's my point. If we recognize that Asia is regaining its historical prominence and Australia is going to be right in the middle of it, and two, 
that we are at the early stages of the fourth industrial revolution in which the ability to innovate will be absolutely crucial. And three, that mega regions are the central competitive unit in which, in which economic activity and innovation thrive. Maybe, maybe we can start thinking about this Melbourne-Sydney rivalry in a whole different light. So what if we were to imagine an Australian East Coast mega region? A mega region not only linking up Brisbane, Melbourne and Canberra, but also uh, Sydney and Melbourne, sorry, Sydney and Melbourne as well. And a mega region like that would need powerful transport networks. Right now, the airways between the three cities are among the busiest in the world. And so we need a much better land transport network. And high-speed rail has been talked about for ages in Australia. And we need to start acting on the ideas that are already out there. But given today's rate of innovation, we might even be able to leapfrog rail technology altogether in favor of Elon Musk's Hyperloop, which is a, is a pod in a vacuum tube that traveled at 1,000 kilometers an hour. So just imagine, that would take you from the CBD in Melbourne to the CBD in Sydney in less than an hour. And I suspect that's quicker than the morning commute of some of you here today. But this is not only an idea about linking up the capital cities, far from it actually, because critical to the formation of a mega region is the activation of the regions. Now imagine that same Hyperloop getting you from Geelong to Melbourne in just five minutes or to Albury and Wodonga in another 15. And yes, I know these technologies are still very much at an early stage, but so were autonomous vehicles only just a few years ago. And that brings me to another aspect of connectivity. An, an East Coast mega region would also need world-class internet. Now, Australia is currently at the bottom of the top 15 global internet speeds. And the, eco the successful economies in the 21st century will be underpinned by digital business models with a global reach. So being at the top, bottom of the top 50 is just not going to cut it, particularly for a country that is geographically as isolated as Australia. However, this is not only an idea about economics. There's also enormous pressures on our cities. And activating the regions will actually release some of the enormous pressures on our cities, which are projected to grow to actually double in size by the middle of this century. And so, without an integrated and holistic planning approach across state boundaries, we're certainly not going to be seeing a doubling of our livability. And finally, there's a wise old saying that says, when goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. And no more is this evident than the continent that I grew up in. Because for centuries and centuries, the European continent was ravaged by wars between pretty much every single country on the continent. And after the Second World War, the devastation of the Second World War, this ultimately led to the formation of the European Union, when Germany and France decided to pool, their com to combine their coal and steel industries. And today it's practically unthinkable for Germany and France to go to war again. So the even deeper global connections that an East Coast mega region would build on, will build on this idea of international collaboration rather than confrontation. So, this Melbourne-Sydney rivalry. What if we stop talking about what one city is better at than the other and instead combine forces on the global stage? What if we truly aim higher and start thinking about what can we do together that we can't do alone? The ideas I've talked about today still need much further development, but I think they're incredibly important to share with you because all too often we get told that it's way too difficult or that we can't afford them. But I think we, start, we should start turning that question around and say, can we afford not to? Thank you.